great. Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, this is the last hour of Extension Conference. It's just about a wrap. So thank you all for staying here and staying engaged. So our final panel, we are so lucky to have three individuals back here. You know all these folks. Kelly Armbruster, Information Specialist with Ag Communication. Uh, Director Hibbert and Director Larry are back. The topic for today's panel is looking into the future of extension. So we'll start off our panel with some comments from each panelist, and then we'll turn it back to you. And I would ask you to be ready with some questions, some thought provoking issues, some things perhaps that you've picked up in the last three days in regards to the future of our extension. So with that, Kelly? Or do we flip a coin? Get us started. But actually, no, I, I have to say it's kind of fun. <laughs> well, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Jody said, uh, Greg Lardy, I prefer he and his. And I, my, my uh, ancestors came to America from uh, Germany and Luxembourg. And so they came in the, the 1850s, just as a little bit of background. Um, let's think about extension and let's think about the future. When, when I think about the future of extension, it's right here in this audience. It's right here in this room. You, you are the future of this organization. The things that you put up on the wall in terms of the new programming ideas and, and what you want to do in terms of innovation around those are part of what's the future of extension. The things that we talked about at this conference in terms of relationships and being the unbiased source of scientific information, relevant information, is the future of extension. The fact that you're here and engaging in this and participating in this is the future of extension. So when I look in, into the lens in terms of you know, what's the vision for, for NDSU extension, what do I see on the horizon? A couple of thoughts. We, we need to continue to work very hard at engaging and building those relationships, whether that's whether you're a specialist in, in building relationships with uh, stakeholder and commodity groups in the state, whether you're in a county office and engaging your local stakeholders with your programming, but building those relationships, getting out of the office, as Chuck talked about the other day, and, and engaging with your audiences, uh, building those interpersonal relationships, and then using that digital media to build on that and, and taking that out and communicating with it, that's the future of extension. So to me, we have to be ready to, to innovate. We have to be ready to change because the world around us is changing. The environment is around us is changing. Uh, at dinner last evening, we were talking about all the changes that have happened in the Bakken region in North Dakota. And so you think about all the opportunities that brings for us as an organization. Uh, what does that mean? We're, we're able to reach out to new audiences that have never heard of NDSU Extension, probably never heard of Extension, period. Coming to us from other states, what are their needs? What are the things that we want to do with them in terms of how do we find out what, what they would most need from our agency? We've got to talk to them, right? We've got to engage in a dialogue with them. So that, to me, is a future of Extension. and, and building those relationships and then being continuing to be that unbiased source of scientific information and coming alongside people as Chuck indicated uh, yesterday as co-learners. Co so what, it, what does our audience already know from, from their experiential learning, from their indigenous knowledge and what do we know based on the research data that's going to help us solve some of these complex problems that are facing us as a state? Great. Great lead in, Greg, thank you. Uh, first of all, it's such an honor and privilege uh, to be invited here to be part of this conversation. So thank you, all of you. I just really, really appreciate it. Um, I wanted to start off by talking about value and uh, how do we provide value to learners, to stakeholders, to elected officials, and what does that value look like? And uh, I think the, uh, the thing, as I think about value, the thing that's really happening is that perception of value is changing and evolving, right? I mean, uh, uh, there were, you know, back in the day when the questions were simple and straightforward, it was pretty easy to deliver on that value proposition that we want to be able to do. 
uh, today it's getting much more complex. Uh, again, at dinner last night, we were talking about that, that really complex system that's evolving in Williston in that area and all the moving parts and the moving parts that we can have some, some part of and be involved in. And, uh, and so to me, part of that and a big part of that is how do we make sure that the work we're doing is relevant to the stakeholders that care so much about who we are and what we do? And how do we figure out what's really relevant? And so uh, every state does this a little bit differently. What we did about four and a half years ago, we did a statewide survey. Uh, we invited certainly our closest friends and stakeholders, but we also invited a bunch of people that uh, weren't necessarily in that category. We, uh, we, we did the survey in Spanish as well to try and invite more participation there. We did through that survey process and about 2,000 Nebraskans responded, so it was a good number. Uh, but we did have a small group then that went through all the information and identified 18 issues that Nebraskans told us were important. Now see, there's, there's a bit of a shift there, right? Because uh, one of the things that people in Extension talk a lot about is we're spread across our states, we're networked, we know what the issues are, right? Well, I think in general, we know what the issues are, but this survey demonstrated to us that there were some issues out there that maybe we were not as familiar with or we were not thinking about as much in terms of emerging issues. So we formed 18 issue teams. We used to work in teams that were, were focused around subject matter. So we had a beef team and a crops team and a family team and a youth team. So this changed the way we thought about collaboration, right? as how we thought about how we work together to take advantage of interdisciplinary knowledge and expertise to address now these issues. So for example, uh, how, do we, uh, how do we create an environment that is beneficial to pollinators is one that was really important. How do we create a food system that uh, people appreciate and value in terms of the kind of food they wanna be able to access? So you can go to our website and look at those if you're interested. But the other thing that was interesting about that is in the last four and a half years, everyone that I've talked to, and it doesn't matter if it's a local stakeholder or an elected official or a university leader or whomever, they like this idea of demand-driven extension based on input from stakeholders. So that's one thing I wanted to mention to you around value is how do we make sure we're relevant and we have to be relevant on things we can do well, right? This is not a suggestion that we go, you know, go off the tracks, but how do we be relevant on things that we can do well? The second thing I wanted to mention, and I touched on this a little bit yesterday, but we put a big focus on learner engagement. And you remember the stair steps and the idea that we plug in based on the issue or the opportunity. It may be something that we, we do a lot of media work and we get a lot of information out. It may be something towards the pilot and the mastery where we're doing a deeper dive, a deeper engagement with a smaller group. We need to, we need to better understand how people learn, how people engage, how people derive value from the work that we do. And so um, thinking about that and learning more about that, I think is a really important opportunity for us because certainly we can use digital media in really productive ways. We need to think about how we do that well. There are other instances where, you know, it's kind of one-on-one. -on -one. We got to be there and we got to, we got to connect and we got to provide value one-on-one. -on -one. I think what that challenges us to do then is to really work on all four levels of that, those stair steps I shared with you yesterday. So think about your learners, think about how they learn, one of the things that uh, was always, uh, I learned uh, a couple of years ago is a misconception. We need to try and, and teach to the learning style of the individual, right? Have you heard that? Have you thought about that? Some people are, you know, they're uh, very hands-on learners. Others are more auditory. Others are more visual. My, the, fa the fallacy in my thinking around that was that, you know, we've got to plan programs that target people who have different learning styles. Well, the reality is in any group of people, the whole diversity of learning styles is there, right? So how do I vary a specific program to engage and address people that have different learning styles? So those are some of the things that we think about, again, in terms of value, how do you add value being relevant, and then thinking about learner engagement. Thank you, Chuck. 
So at my very first extension conference um, four years ago, there was a similar panel on the last day, and I think it was about work-life balance. I think Greg said on it, and Crystal Shoneman um, started off by saying she doesn't, she didn't know how she got up on that stage, and I'm feeling a little bit of, of the same way today. <laughs> I, Crystal, that resonated with me. <laughs> um, but I'm going to take it um, a step even. These guys kind of talked on a macro level. I'm going to talk a little bit on a micro level about um, once we've um, established some programs that are innovative or we, and we've um, identified those needs, how do we then market those programs to our people? Um, if you Google trends in marketing, the number one thing that pops up is purpose-driven marketing. And it so um, parallels with what we're doing in Extension, creating programs with purpose, right? And so as I, um, you know, kind of survey Extension and, and look at some of the marketing that we're doing, so many times we get stuck in a rut. And, um, and last year, you know, let's say last year you put on a uh, babysitting workshop, for example, you know, it's easy to um, put the title of that workshop as as babysitting workshop and the date and at the fairgrounds and, and go on with it. But what if instead we thought about what's the per true purpose of this workshop? Well, and, and how does, um, what is the intrinsic motivation that might get someone to come to that program? Well, for a 15 year old, it might be that they wanna earn money on the side that they can buy the latest video game or whatever it is um, that, you know, so um, how can we be more purposeful and think about the true purpose of the programs and that we do and do that, you know, um, and, and market to that. Um, my second point is about influencers. Um, we see on Instagram, uh, Facebook, whatever social media uh, medium that you are engaged with, we see influencers are taking over. Um, So-and-so likes this product, right? Um, beauty gurus, for the women in the room, how many of us have watched a, um, a maybe a makeup tutorial on YouTube from an influencer? Or maybe if you're into crafts, there's there are people on YouTube that, um, you know, they have millions of views to um, make necklaces or quilts or whatever it is. There's, these people are influencers in the industry. And um, we talk a lot about telling our story, right? It's te we tell the story, but really, these in the the future is other people telling our story, and that's what we you know we talk about external stakeholders all the time, and um, you know I think about well how do we do that as a as an introvert I try to put myself in in a county person's shoes, and I think, man, if I was moving to a county and I was asked to go out and um, find those stakeholders and encourage them to help Extension tell their story. I think, how would I do that? I don't, I don't even know anybody here. What, you know, what does that look like for me as, as a new person? I know we've got a lot of new employees. And so um, I really kind of thought about that. And um, I think the, the key to that is uh, making a connection with just one person, right? Do you have a 4-H um, parent volunteer that has been part of the program for 30 years? If you can make that one connection and ask them to help you connect with other people, um, that is so powerful. I think about, you, know, you think about the little ways that, oh, just go to your local coffee shop. Just go to the sale barn. Just walk in, you know, the grocery store and talk to someone. That, you know, for, for um, a new employee or someone that, that who's not comfortable with that, that is not reality. Um, getting a list of talking points to hand to stakeholders and saying, would you talk about extension, um, you know, to benefit us? That's, that's hard to do. How, do. how do we really do that? Well, we do that by making connections and by asking people to help us make connections, to introduce us to the movers and shakers in the county, the bank president, the fair board member whoever that is. So um, I, I think that's truly important that influencers, people telling our story for us is truly the future. I'm going to ask for these guys to, um, we're going to do a little, I want to, I want to share a little bit about the power 
of influence and we're going to have a little fun this morning this feels very serious so we're going to we're going to laugh a little bit they don't know that this is happening we're <laughs> i haven't I, I didn't preface this i know <laughs> so i've got these two gentlemen here with us and um i'm going to ask greg now greg's a very humble sincere person but i'm going to ask greg to take the microphone and to repeat after me I am the greatest extension administrator in all the land. I am the greatest extension administrator in all the land. Do you believe him? <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. Now, I'm going to hand this microphone to Chuck, and I'm going to ask him to repeat after me. Greg Lardy is the greatest admin extension administrator in all the land. Greg Lardy is the greatest extension administrator in all the land. Woo! Yeah. Do you believe Chuck when he says that? <laughs> That's the power of someone else saying it, right? So um, it's important for us to tell our story, but it's just as important for people to help us. So I encourage you to... Um, connect with those people and, and create those relationships so that we can do that. Finally, I've had this mic for a lot longer than I planned. Um, I was told this week that someone referred to me as the queen of branding in one of the sessions, which was surprising because I've been called the warden a lot more than <laughs> the queen. <laughs> but I'll take it. So um, I, on the first day of conference, I sat at the back of the room and I got teary-eyed because um, if you don't know it yet, on Monday morning at 8.30, um, there's a, we flip the switch and there's a new extension homepage and there's all new topic sites. It's about eight months in the making and, and it's not a, a team did this and, and they are to be credited. But um, So I had my laptop up and the new extension homepage was up. All new branding, all new signs were up, all new banners. And Miranda Meehan was speaking using the all new uh, PowerPoint templates. And I thought, holy cow, we look like an awesome modern organization. And I got chills because of it. And so I think that it is truly, even though I harp on it all the time, it is truly important for us to continue to use those tools to make sure that we consistently brand ourselves, that we ride for the brand every single day so that people in Fargo, Williston, Sargent County, Pemina County, across the state know that we are connected to the mothership in DSU, and <laughs> I was listening, and that, <laughs> and that they connect the programs and the things that we do with extension. So that's my final thoughts. Thank you. So does anyone have a follow-up question to that powerful um, final comment here? Questions, comments, Catalan? Okay, so with the new website redesign and how incredible it looks, do you have any suggestions on for our own county pages, how we can make it look sleek and modern and up to date with today's, you know, just how life is. So that is the next phase um, of, of the web redesign, but I can say that that's a major step and one that we're asking the legislature for some, I believe that's part of our request is, is for some additional human capital to be able to do that. Um, in the session that Bob and I uh, did yesterday, we um, it was called County Website Framework Session of some sort. And so um, we ask people to think about their current website and think about the things on that website, on your current website, that build trust, are a local resource, build relationships, and I just <laughs> blanked out. <laughs> build relationships, be a local resource. I can't remember the fourth one. I'm, I'm terrible. I'm sorry about that. Um, but so, you know, those are the things that 
that you do anyway. So how do we make your digital presence reflect that as well? And so, um, you know, the simple things like stuff that's old and outdated, um, you know, that needs to go away. Think of your county website as a classroom, not a library, right? And so um, some quick, simple cleanup things can do that. But I also want you to know that we are working. We, we took the feedback from that group yesterday, and that will help us inform your county web strategy as we move forward. Um, I don't know if anybody has gone to food.unl.edu, not that you necessarily would, but if you haven't, I'd encourage you to go there. And it's for two reasons. One is it's a very robust research driven platform that engages all issues around food. But here's the other reason I'd like you to go there. Maybe you do this already. And so I'm being a little presumptive, but uh, the, the people that manage that website use social media to drive traffic to the website. Okay. And so we think about social media sometimes as a separate and independent uh, mode of communication. But in this case, social media is used in very deliberate ways. So Facebook, Pinterest, Tw Twitter, all that stuff. And, uh, and what's happening with that website is that they average 45 to 60,000 page views a week. Second only to Husker Athletics. Any other, is there other comments or questions? Could you repeat that website again? Food.unl.edu. So I have a question. As we were preparing for the panel, we were discussing about how the face of our organization has changed and how different this room looks than it did even three years ago. And so we have a great deal of institutional knowledge, yet we have some new and exciting ideas in the room. As those who participated in the session yesterday on um, Xers and millennials and getting those, how do, how do we reach those, uh, that audience? So I, I'm wondering if someone has um, some suggestions for our, our newer staff members, and we're looking at the future of extension, what, what are some examples of how you have reached those audiences? We can't continue to do the same thing again and again and wonder why things aren't changing. So I, I know some of you have done some really innovative, amazing things. So how, give us a, an example of, of how, what you've done to reach a new audience. Don't make me call on you. Brad, good. Well, I don't know about you, but uh, being the old guy in the room, <clears throat> I still remember when mine John was director of extension, okay? Um, our younger crowd is not much of a meeting meeting going crowd. So what I have done is, is um, and I have been somewhat successful with it, is do demonstrations, do tours, do things where we get them actually on farms and not in a formal setting. And then after they do that, then, then they start making the phone calls and then contacting you. So sometimes you just have to uh, take it, take it to a different place. And once they are comfortable with, with that different place, then they start to contact you in, in maybe a more formal fashion, although I do still get stuff, on my phone and, and other things. I don't tweet, I don't Twitter, and I don't do the bird thing, but um, my young people do find me now that they put a face to me. Anyone else? Okay. I'll take that other spectrum. I am definitely not an old person in extension. I've only been with the organization like two and a half years. Everybody thinks I've been here longer. Um, I engage the youth and the youth help me engage their parents. Um, so if you get involved with your youth and get them active, they learn who you are, then their parents seek you out. My kid came home and told me, you know how to do this. Yes, 
would you like to learn more? You know, come to this workshop, do this, we're doing this, or, you know, so-and-so in my county is doing this. You know, I, I go to a lot of other organizations, I get invited to their meetings, people see me, being visible is important. So that's my piece. Is Lindy Berg still around today? I'm going to put you on the spot, Lindy. Will you talk a little bit about what we talked at lunch today about new farmers and, and their need maybe for extension? It's a safe place. It's, it's okay. a safe place. I'll stand next to you. Oh, man. Do you have any specific questions about it that I could piggyback off of? Just tell me about, the, you talked about the study you did and what, and what you thought new farmers were needing possibly from extension in terms of certification that might be an opportunity for extension to do that? Can you? Um, yeah, I guess. So what I'm working on um, as part of my master's um, uh, project is um, dealing with small farmers. And how it kind of got started was um, I would get people coming in that wanted, they moved out to the country, got a few acres or so, and they want to kind of start a little farm. And I didn't really have a whole lot of information to give them. And I'm like, how many, you know, we have some resources and there's a lot of other states that have great resources. But I'm like, I wonder, like, especially now that I've gotten um, to do a lot of research on this, I know now like a lot of the small farmer organizations. And so I know that, but I bet a lot of agents do not. And so where does that information come in? And so my project um, basically surveyed small farmers, um, and there's a few objectives that I um, covered, such as who are the small farmers in North Dakota? Um, what are their challenges and limitations that they're facing? What, where are they going to get their resources if they're not coming to us? And are they using extension? Do they know who we are? And then, um, oh, what was the last one? Um, oh, and then how are they how are they connecting with extension? So um, in the survey, it kind of answers a lot of the questions. And I think I had um, 76 usable participants. I think at 110 originally, but so 76 small farmers. Um, so it's pretty good data, and hopefully um, that will data will show quite a bit because it does show where those challenges lie. And so I'm kind of I'm hoping that. Um, with working with some of the things on food safety, we have a lot of good resources in food safety. And what my survey is showing, um, that food safety didn't even rank in the top 10 um, for small farmers. And so that's one of the things that it's like, okay, well, how can we get this to be a priority and get them to these different workshops and things like that? So yeah, hopefully that'll be coming down the pipeline. <laughs> I would encourage you, maybe you've already thought about this and done this, but share the survey results back with the people who participated in the survey, right? I mean, to me, this is one of the, this is a great example, I think, of, of a way to engage people in a way where there's a co-discovery, a co-learning opportunity, you're setting a new baseline, you're building the relationships. I think they would enjoy hearing back from you what you learned from the study. Maybe you've done that. is that the small farmers, um, we asked them how they want their information. And they wanted one-on-one, -on -one, hands-on workshops. And so social media was pretty low on the list. And so it's like, if we are using Facebook to try and tap small farmers, that's not how they want to receive their information. So if they want one-on-one, -on -one, well, let's get those workshops and let's do those hands-on and let's visit these small farmers and learn how to help them adapt new resources on their farms. So it sounds like we need a combination 
one-two punch. Um, something that was discussed, Acacia, I'm going to put you on the spot here. We talk about relationships. That's been discussed a lot this morning and all week. And Acacia is a rock star at building relationships. She's fearless. I saw her walk into the cafe in Napoleon at a table of 10 gentlemen. Um, we were there for a tri-county tourism meeting, and Acacia just sat down and struck up a conversation and invited them all to the meeting because they were all obviously Germans from Russia. And so um, they needed to attend the meeting. And so uh, as Kelly and I talked, that, that doesn't come so easy for, for us or for some of you in the room. That's not so easy to do. Um, but I'm wondering if perhaps our panel or all of you could give us some exact examples some specific examples of how you have built those relationships because I hear from from newer agents who struggle to build audiences and I offer good programs and people don't show up it's about relationships so could could someone share some examples or specific examples how how do we how do we do that one-on-one -on -one, Lindy how do we meet our one-on-one -on -one producers that want to engage with us in our programs I would say that one way to build those relationships is knowing that you want people to show up to your stuff and knowing that our programs are valuable and we think that it's really great for a program or a community or a person or a school, um, but showing up that the things that they value. I think that that's important and then it shows that's where the trust is built, that's where that relationship is built and some of those conversations can happen um, when you're showing your vested interest in something else that doesn't have anything to do with your program or project. Are you trying not to make eye contact with me? <laughs> that's it. Um, I guess the first thing that came to mind is, and I think that's where she was going, Jan was going, is show up at their events. Be part of the community. Let them see you as being approachable and let them get to know you as well as you get to know them. I mean, that's, that's critical. So join a club. Uh, go bowling, I don't care, whatever it is you're interested in, but be in the community. Could I tell you a story that changed my life? Please. So in 2002, when I was working in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, um, we were having a workshop, and one of the people that showed up at the workshop was a woman by the name of Jackie Cervantes Guzman. And I'd known Jackie from the community. She was a school teacher, an elementary school teacher. And uh, I said, you know, Jackie, uh, it would be awesome if you came to work for extension. And she said, you know, I've been doing this for 25 years. I've been thinking about doing something differently and I might consider doing that. And so we were successful in hiring Jackie, um, the first Hispanic woman working in my district. And I was excited about that opportunity. But I, as Jackie started, I said, um, Jackie, I don't want you to do the Hispanic audience engagement for us. I want you to do the Hispanic audience engagement with us. And she said, sure, that makes a lot of sense. Let's bring other resources to this conversation, other resources to this audience. And um, I said, okay, where do we start? And she said, uh, we started at the soup kitchen at the Guadalupe Center. And I said, okay, what's that mean? I've never done that. She said, we'll bring a crew in from, uh, from the district uh, every month. We'll do this once a month and we'll serve soup and we'll clean up and we'll do all that stuff. We will be in service to the people that we would like to build a relationship with. And so we did that. And I remember the very first uh, first event that we did, we uh, we served soup and and you know we go around and ask people if they wanted seconds and so on. And uh, I noticed a lot of people that were there, and certainly in that setting, these are very needy people. Uh, and uh, um, and what was interesting was when we went for the second month, a lot of the same people came back again. 
and I asked Jackie, tell me about some of these people. And she said, well, this family over here is Hanson Poor Bear, the local tribal leader for the Lakota community in Scotts Bluff. And she said, I'd love for you to connect with Hanson. And so she went over and we introduced and I, I said hello and we chatted for just a few minutes. That's all it was. And the third month we served soup and sure enough, Hanson and his family were there again. And the fourth month, Hanson and his family were there again, except what happened the fourth month when I went around to serve seconds, Hanson said, would you like to sit down? And I thought, oh my gosh. Here's an opportunity for me to get to know someone that I never would have had an opportunity to get to know under any other circumstances. And I sat down and that started a partnership with the Lakota community where we did educational programs, we did powwows, we did an amazing number of things to bring and engage, bring the Lakota people to the Panhandle Research and Extension Center and to do the kinds of things that they valued and they wanted from us. So I share that experience with you because, yeah, maybe it's kind of the coffee shop experience, but the point is you go to them and you find out a way, you figure out a way to be in service to them, and that opens doors and gives you opportunities to connect with people that you may never have ever thought you could communicate in any, or connect with in any other way. It changed my life. One other thing I'd add to that, when, when I was getting started as a specialist in extension in, in 97 and 98, when, when, when I got opportunities, occasionally people would invite me to their ranches and their farms and say, hey, would you like to come out? I, I want to show you, you know, a, a cattle handling system, or I want you to take a look at this uh, ration I'm, I've been feeding. Take advantage of those invitations. That's, that's an invitation to develop that relationship and really get one-on-one -on -one because you're you're with them in their environment you've removed a barrier in terms of it's not a meeting setting anymore it's not a classroom setting you're with them in their environment similar to what chuck was talking about you take that opportunity you take advantage of that invitation so when you get those invitations go do it go go to their farms go to the ranches go to their places of, of work go to their business go to their homes because that's where you can truly start to develop those relationships and build the trust that was talked about because that, that's going to lead then to figuring out what are the additional programming opportunities, how do we develop a, a program in this arena, how do we develop a program for this audience. Okay. So we focused a lot about external relationships and the future of extension. And a, something was brought up to me earlier in the conference about building some of those relationships with our newer extension staff. And we've used, I'm going to use your term, Dr. Hibbard, co-creating knowledge. I love that. I'm going to go old school and get out the tape and tape that to my computer when I get back to the office. <laughs> so I'm curious, how do we help build relationships within our own organization? We have a, a lot of new faces here today. What, what can we do to make you feel welcome, those of you that are newer? What, what would that look like? How, how do we welcome you? How do we make you feel valued because you are? I learned a great deal from the session on uh, millennials yesterday. You don't want us to leave a phone number for to be called. <laughs> so, so what do we what do we do to keep you in, engaged in our system and feeling valued? So as a new agent, I, I felt really empowered and just great by how much everybody reached out to me. Um, people from across the state were, you know, calling me, emailing me, just saying, welcome to Extension. Here's the advice I have for you. Please always call me if you ever need help. And that just meant so much to me because as a new extension agent, it was a little overwhelming. And then just, it was also my first, I, I don't know how else to call it, but I call it my big girl job. So <laughs> it just, it meant so much to me just to have, you know, the support of just not even my neighboring community and agents, but just people from, you know, across the state. It meant so much to me. So I, I really just appreciated that. I feel like, 
FCW agents are really just, they're great. Um, so if you, <laughs> not to be biased, but I mean, if you want help knowing how to welcome new employees, I would reach out to them because they just, they made me feel so wonderful and just, just so proud to be part of this organization. That's a wonderful testimony. Anyone else? Yeah, Greg? Well, this isn't my first big girl job, so I'll take that <laughs> one. But, um, I think it was the first or second day, and I don't know where Marsha is, but Marsha, when I was a little tyke, was actually our FCW agent down in Dunn County. And she gave me a call. And I hadn't heard her voice in, we'll call it many years, not to, not to date the conversation. But she said, do you remember me? And as soon as I heard her voice, I'm like, yeah, of course I do. And it's just that connection of, I grew up 4-H. I had those relationships, uh, did FFA, did all that. And what we're finding in our counties back home, or the organizations that we have back home, is the people that are active in our communities are the ones that come from those types of organizations. So that was what, and I had the same experience. People were calling and the last seven, eight months, it's being engaged in all the different things. I've you know, met all these people that have brought me into different programs, showed me what to do, and that's the relationships that help bring us in, is keep us involved, keep us relevant, because that first year is really difficult. I mean, it is hard to get into it kind of a thing, because it's different. This is completely different than any other job that I've had. And I've had some really scary ones, and I do some really scary stuff anyway. I'm on the fire department, and I was in the Army. So, I mean, that's something. It's keep us involved. So maybe jo just, Jody, yeah, let, me, let me ask a question. So for, for those of you that have been in this organization 10 years or more, uh, raise your hand if you had a mentor somebody in the organization that mentored you. So keep your hands up. So keep your hands up if you have taken the opportunity now to formally or informally mentor somebody else. Yeah, so we, we need to continue to pay this forward. When, when I came into the organization, I had a number of specialists and experienced agents that, that taught me the ropes. You know, what, what programs do you wanna focus on? What advice do you have? Those are things that are really valuable for our younger people to, to hear, for somebody to come alongside them and co-learn with them, not to tell them what to do, but to give them the assurance that they're welcome in this organization, that they have a place, that, that there are things that they can feel where they fit in. As you start an extension job and you're doing well, what happens to you? You get busy, right? You get busy. In fact, you can get real busy real fast. And um, I thought about this a lot. You know, how do we mentor, how do we coach not only new employees, but everybody in the organization to think about how you're going to use your time? What are the things that you want to be able to do in your job that you really value? I love seeing the hands of the mentors. That's one of the most important things that you can do. But if you don't set aside time for that, uh, what, you're going to add it to your already busy schedule? We talked a little bit yesterday about how do you carve out time for professional development, and I suggested two to four hours a week. How are you going to find time for that? See, that's one of the challenges that we have in this job, right? Because there's no one there that's that's going to tell us that we've done enough. And so the tendency is to do more. And pretty soon, as Greg talked about yesterday, it eats into your evenings and your weekends and your family time and so on. So I'd encourage all of you to really think deeply about how you want to invest your time and how you want to invest the best of you in that time in ways that add value to what you're trying to accomplish and the work that you do in service to others. So busyness is one of the biggest challenges that we face in extension, I think, across this country. Figure out how to manage it.
So I'm not old, and maybe I am. Some of you I kind of remember when you are in 4-H. But I'm also not young, but I also want to give a story about taking a chance. So there's an old guy up in McLean County named Pat Carpenter. And he's kind of a rebel rouser. I didn't know that when I started. But I could call Pat up and come up with the craziest idea ever. In fact, Greg and Charlie probably were like, that's so freaking crazy. We can't even believe we hired her. And I'd say, hey, Pat, what do you think about this idea? I think that's the best damn idea I've ever heard. Let's try it. Now, Pat, at the time, was probably 65 or 70 years old, okay? I could say that to a lot of people that were in my age group, and they would have said, we tried that already, it didn't work. They tried that in Morton County, it didn't work. Pat would never tell me, we tried that once and it worked. He might say to me, you know, Lisa, we tried that, but I think with this change, it'll work. So one of the things I would tell all of you in this room is that if somebody calls you up with some crazy old harebrained idea, don't tell them we tried that and it didn't work. Don't tell them I don't think that'll work. Take a chance. The worst you're going to do is fail forward. Well, minus maybe ending up in jail, but I hope it's not that crazy of an idea. <laughs> but take that chance. The best programs I've ever done were on taking those chances. And Scott and Bruce and I went to KISS yesterday. And they were like, how do you know all these people in KISS? It's because it, somebody took a chance on my crazy ideas or I took a chance on theirs to meet the people who'd be hanging out at KISS at some point in time. And so take that chance. You'll meet people that you never, ever believed you'd meet, and you'll make impacts you never thought you could. And I don't know if that fit into all that, but I, I think taking a chance and moving out of the box a little bit really will get you a long ways. And now Nicole Wardner's my, yeah, I think we can do that. I do believe someone talked about um, being bold the other, <laughs> the other day. <laughs> Thank you, Lise. All right. So I think our time is about up. Um, does anybody have any final comments or our panel? Okay. okay. Catelyn, you're a rock star today. For anybody who doesn't know, it was my birthday yesterday, so. <laughs> and and we already sang to me, so don't feel the need to. Um, <laughs> I, I do want to add to my comment earlier. Also, I want to give a little shout out to my district director. He's been so great and has made me feel so welcome. And honestly, whenever he talks to me, I feel like I'm his only agent. And I forget that he's got, like, just such a huge district. And so I just want to say thank you. That's a great high point to end on. So how about a thank you for our panel today. Thank you. All right, thanks Jody. And thank you everybody for coming and I think you've heard the word engaged a lot of times uh, the past couple of days here. Um, thanks again to uh, Elizabeth Cronin. I don't think we could have organized this thing without her. So a uh, round of applause for her. And uh, everybody that uh, spoke, great job. I think uh, we had a nice um, time to engage with each other. We had some nice break time to uh, network and talk. And uh, I think it was a good conference. So drive safe, everybody. I know some of you got a long ways to go. Um, I guess you want to say any final words? So just uh, as you leave, uh, as Ryan said, travel safely home. This group is a future of So as you leave here and you think about this conference and you think about the innovations you want to put in place, those are the things that we're going to be talking about 10 years from now. Hey, do you remember when we came up with this idea? Do you remember when we did this at the 2018 conference? So as you leave here, be thinking about the innovations you're going to put in place to drive the future of this organization. Thanks and have a great weekend.